Tom uh, left the army in 2013 after a distinguished career where he served operationally in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and most recently as the military assistant for the chief of defence staff. Um, after two years in Afghanistan, Tom did a further two years where he received an MBE in his last uh, patrol in 2009. Tom now sits on the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee in the House of Commons and is working on dementia issues. He is a dementia friend and is a keen supporter of the Alzheimer's Society. When we talked to Tom and, and Matt, um, Tom expressed a keen interest in coming today and speaking to business representatives to see what you had to say. Um, we've taken that opportunity to follow on closely from behind the budget to get an insight from Tom into what he feels the budget really does mean for small and medium sized businesses. It's Tom. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, inviting me this morning. I'm extremely glad to be here because I'm entirely aware uh, where benefits for our country come from. They don't come from imaginary entities. They don't come from... Sorry, sir. Are you using slides? No. Could we open the curtains a bit so we can see? You certainly can. Sure. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll do that. The... Um, we don't, they don't come from imaginary entities that we call, you know, Starbucks or, or, or Amazon. They come from the hard work of people in this country who set up businesses, who, st who take risk, who invest their own efforts and their own money, and who generate employment and who generate the benefits that we see across our country, whether in roads or hospitals or police forces or whatever it happens to be. So I'm entirely aware that small businesses are not only the backbone of this country, but they're also the ribs, the spine, the legs, the arms, the fingers, they are the lot. So I'm very, very pleased to be here because Capital Space has done a lot around the country, but particularly here, to allow that flexible growth possibility. And many of you are therefore clients of them, but also many of you have come here for other reasons and to get benefit from McBride's, and I certainly have myself as I still do a little bit of investing uh, on, on the side, as it were, and I'm very glad for a little bit of advice that I just got there. I will, if you'll allow me a quick diversion, dementia matters to me hugely, and I would urge as many of you as possible to become dementia friends. If it doesn't affect you now, I'm very sorry to say it will affect you at some point in the next few years. We're all going to be affected. About a third of us are going to get some form of dementia or Alzheimer's, and the other two thirds will be dealing with it, either with relatives or friends. So if I can urge you as a quick plug to get involved in Dementia Friends in some way, um, I'd be hugely grateful. But look, the budget that you saw that George delivered, that the Chancellor delivered in the, well, the first one anyway, that George delivered in the, uh, in the House of Commons uh, a couple of weeks ago, was designed to do exactly what, to, uh, what was just explained. It was designed to be favourable to small businesses. It was designed to attack um, the unfair practices of some of the large companies who are using uh, tax games, I think is the most polite way of putting it, uh, not to pay VAT, not to pay their contribution to our society. And I hope that this has gone some of the way towards it. Now, let's not kid ourselves. This isn't the final answer, but it is a start. You know, when we start to see Google being taxed, Okay, £150 million isn't an awful lot for Google. Let's not get ourselves on that one either. But it's more than they've ever paid before in this country. It's more by, in fact, £150 million. More. So we are beginning to address the inequalities of the system that have meant that small businesses like yours have been punished and because they've been in competition with companies that have been able to take advantage of various loopholes and games. Now, what you've seen today is uh, a fundamental uh, change in that because what the uh, removing companies from business rates uh, has done here is it's taken 2,000 companies out of business rates. What the change in um, capital gains tax, what the change in corporation tax mean is that, and I'm afraid this is uh, not, not great for um, some accountancy firms, but for honest accountancy firms like McBride's, it'll make no difference at all. But it will mean that the loopholes that people used to spend a fortune setting up, those sort of offshore tax structures, that if you started a business a few years ago, your accountants would come and try and sell you these extraordinary plans as to how you would put your money through somewhere here and somewhere there. They're not worth doing. 
They're not worth doing because you're going to pay more on the lawyer's fees and the accountant's fees than you're going to save in the tax. Now that's really good. That's really good because it means that our country will start to get more of the benefit. You will not have the unequal playing field and overall the whole country will benefit. So look, I'm very sorry to say, but I don't have an awful lot of time. So I'm very happy to stop talking there and to start taking questions because you're going to have a much better idea as to what you want to know than I do. And I can be pretty sure one that's going to come up is about the European Union. I'm very happy to answer it. Um, I'm sure there are others going to come up, um, but, but I, won't, uh, I won't do what the, uh, what the army calls situating the estimate and I will allow you to, to, to fire your questions rather than shaping it for you. Would anybody like to kick off? Any questions, guys? What is your view on Europe? <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I'm for in. Um, I'm for in for a, very, for a couple of very simple reasons. Um, the first is, I know this is absurd because we are on an island, but no man is an island in the sense that uh, we are bound into our environment uh, in various ways. The various European countries who are our nearest trading partners no, they're not our only trading partners, but they are our nearest trading partners, are going to proceed in some degree anyway. The, qu the only question, as far as I'm concerned, is do you want a seat at the table or do you not want a seat at the table? And when I was a diplomat, the, uh, the expression was always, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> it's partly true. It's partly true. You know, it is certainly true that it wouldn't be a complete disaster for the UK if we were to leave. It wouldn't be, I don't think. I mean, you know, it would be fine in the long run. But there would be a hiatus. How long would that hiatus be? Six months, two years, five years? Nobody really knows. What would that mean for investment in this country? Nobody really knows. Uh, would we get a trade deal with the European states in some way afterwards? I'm sure we would. Would it be as good or better or worse? Nobody really knows. Um, a lot of people are coming out with a lot of facts that aren't facts. The truth is, consistently, nobody really knows. Now, it may, it may be better. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, there's a lot of very clever people arguing that we should leave, and I'm sure they know many, many things that I don't. Um, uh, but on this, I'm afraid I come down to a simple principle of soldiering, which is... And I, I know all of you will have read the U.S. Army Field Manual for soldiering, which is a, <laughs> your basic reading, but it's, there's a great principle in it, which is do one thing every day that improves your defensive position. Just one thing. Dig that trench a bit lower, make sure you've got a bit more ammunition, whatever it happens to be. And it's a very good principle for soldiering. And I have to say, I think it's a very good principle for politics or for business. Do one thing every day. It just makes you a little bit better. And I'm not convinced that this is an improvement. On the contrary, I think it injects a huge amount of doubt that it is not possible to answer through, don't worry chaps, it'll be all right on the night. It, it might be, it might be, but that's a hell of a gamble. And, you know, when I stand here and look at this room, let me be perfectly honest, I'm, you know, I'm in politics, I'm not gambling with my career, I've got another four years of this before you turn around and fire me. I'm gambling with yours and your employees and the people who rely on you to generate business. Now, you may think that that's a reasonable thing to do. I don't. Peter, go on. Yes, if, if the other members of the union are all committed to ever close the union, politically and economically, and we've said we're not, how does that, how do you see us looking ahead five, ten, fifty years? I, I mean, I, I have to say, I don't think these statements mean quite what people think they mean, if, you, if, you, if you'll forgive me. In the sense that all relationships, whether they be limited liability partnerships, whether they be marriages or whether they be political alliances, evolve and change. So what people spoke about in the 1950s, quite rightly, because they were looking at a post-war Europe, you know, the destruction of Germany, the end of Italy, you know, all these sort of moments of huge trauma. And they talked about ever closer union. And that became sort of part of, the, part of the DNA of the project. But you look at it today where 40% of France is talking about uh, withdrawing from the European Union, 25% of Germany, Greece is suffering on any number of different bases from, you know, 
its own economic situation, but is also now talking about withdrawing. You know, you've got a completely different conversation, and the idea that there's only the UK that's talking about not having every ever closer union is simply untrue. I mean, read the Italian papers or the French papers or the German papers, and they're talking about a more flexible European structure. Now, that may not be what Mr. Schultz and Mr. Juncker are talking about. And we get this illusion that because they're called president, they're in charge. They're not presidents in any real sense, any more than Jeremy Hayward is president of the UK government. Now, you may not have heard of Jeremy Hayward. He's the cabinet secretary. He's the most senior civil servant in the United Kingdom. He's incredibly powerful. And his job is exactly the same as Mr. Juncker. He does what the politicians tell him. He has no personal mandate. He has no personal authority. Now, one of the, I mean, there are many criticisms to have of the European Union, and I don't, certainly don't look at it as some sort of starry-eyed experiment. It isn't one. But like all alliances, I, I'm of the opinion that you look at what you've got and you weigh up what's better going forward, not how would you start in an ideal world. Well, in an ideal world, no, of course we wouldn't have started like this, but guess what? This is where I started. And the reality is that the conversation that David Cameron has started, well, that's not true even. The conversation that David Cameron has continued that has got us to his point of renegotiation, which was the deal he came back with, is not a final status. It's part of a continuing dialogue. And if you look at the conversations that's being had, for example, with the Danes, or with the Swedes, or with the Dutch, actually the pressure for greater reform is, is there. Now, the idea that whatever happens on 23rd of June, our relationship with the European Union therefore finishes, is also untrue. We're going to have a relationship with these countries for the next 100,000 years, whatever happens. Now, the only question is, how do you want to have that dialogue? Do you think it is better? And this is, you know, this is a fair question, and many people here will have different opinions. But do you think it is better to withdraw and to have no influence on them, or limited? Or do you think it's better to stay and have some? Now, neither is a perfect answer, but, but let's not pretend we're being offered perfect solutions. We're not. And you know, for myself, one of, the, one of the big things that I look at, I mean, I look at security as well, and you know, you'll have heard a huge number of debates about security over the last few weeks, and I'm sure you'll hear a whole number over the coming years. And I'm not gonna argue that, you know, would have been that much safer, you know, Belgium won't happen, you know, that Belgian blast won't happen in London if we stay or if we go. I, I don't think either side of that is true. You know, we will exchange information with our allies whether we stay or whether we go. That's not the security angle I'm going to argue. I don't, I don't think it's honest, frankly. I don't think it's true. I think we're going to work together on those sort of security issues whether we stay or whether we go. The one thing for me that matters on security is... Look, our economy is going to be fine over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We've got, for a whole series of reasons, we've got a history of governments that uh, enable free business, that enable, um, you know, I mean, since the 1970s, thank God, when those, the old days of the, the real socialist governments ended in the 1979 election. Since then, we've had governments, even, even Labour ones under Tony Blair, that have actually favor been favorable to business, that have seen enterprise grow, that have seen taxes, you know, broadly speaking, go up, that have engendered prosperity and stability in our country. That's not true on the other side of the, uh, of the channel. That's not true if you look at Poland or Hungary or Romania or Bulgaria. It's not even true if you look at the Czech Republic and some parts of Germany. Now, I therefore ask myself, if we withdraw and we see those countries falter and we see them suffer, what are they going to do? Well, first of all, they're going to trade less with us, so it's going to be bad for us. Secondly, they're going to spend less on their own security. Why? Well, they've got less tax take. Of course they do, so they're, they're going to spend less. And I don't see how our security is improved when the security of our nearest neighbours suffers because they fail economically. I just, I don't see it. Now, that again doesn't mean that, you know, we must stay at any price. That doesn't mean that it's a disaster for the UK if we leave. But I don't see it as better. And I'm not, you know, I'm not starry-eyed idealist about the European project. I think like all alliances, like all projects, you look at it clear-eyed in the morning light 
and you try to decide whether today it is the best answer for you. And today it is the best. Tomorrow it may not be, but today it is. Yes, sorry, Roger. You've been talking about trade. Many people criticise Brussels for imposing terms and conditions mm. which people don't understand. <coughs> if we come at it, does that mean all our laws, etc., which have been imposed upon us by Brussels, will just be written off and we start all over again imposing our own laws and safety measures, etc.? The, the truth is, Roger, nobody knows. Because, as you know, um, many of the laws that are... Brussels laws are actually from the World Trade Organization, they're from the UN, they're from the International Labour Organization, they're from any number of different international transnational bodies. They come to us as EU laws because the EU is our seat on those tables. But actually, if it wasn't through the EU, it comes stri straight from the WTO. So when, the, when China agrees a trade deal, for example, oh, sorry, when China has some labour conditions on steel or whatever it happens to be, and steel, as you'll, you'll have heard Port Talbot this morning, is all over the news, you know, the tariffs, the anti-dumping, all that sort of stuff. It comes straight from the WTO. Now, we hear it as a EU law because that's our trade route. But actually, whether or not the EU were there, we'd still have to do the same thing. The same is true of car standards, you know, vehicle emission standards, indicator, you know, brightness, the, 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 the dip on the various car headlights. I mean, people complain about the EU on those. And, they're WTO standards. You, know, you, don't, you don't have to sign up to them, of course you don't, but nor do you have to sell cars to Brazil. <laughs> you, know, you, you could. I mean, this is where you get into the argument of sovereignty. You, know, you can be completely sovereign in this country. You really can in, in this world. And there is one country that is completely sovereign and obeys nobody. It's called North Korea. You know, everybody else plays, sacrifices some element of its sovereignty in order to cooperate with others. Uh, you, know, you may argue that the EU sacrifices too much, and that's a reasonable argument, and people do make that reasonable argument. Um, you know, various people in the United States argue that they sacrifice too much of their sovereignty into NATO. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear that as a former serviceman, I would hope very, very much that they don't feel that too much, because if they do, uh, we will be not only doubling but quadrupling our defence budget at the expense of many other things. Yes, sir. Um, my business has survived for over 30 years now. We've lived through various recessions. Um, and sometimes it's been, been very painful. And sometimes you have to do things that you wouldn't otherwise choose to do. Nothing's out of order. Anyone who had a job at the beginning of this recession and still got a job is actually quite well off now because the interest rates are very low. Mm. So. Um, is it possible to increase income tax for a short period in, or, or in order uh, to pay off this deficit that we're all faced with, rather than having all these stealth tax and a tax on the disabled and so on like, that seem to be going on as far as I'm concerned? In other words, where in the Ten Commandments does it say thou shalt never ever raise the basic rates of income tax? I'm, I'm afraid, sir, it's not in the Ten Commandments, but it's in the basic law of electoral politics. Yes. Uh, um, first of all, I'm going to challenge you on one thing. There hasn't been a stealth tax on the disabled, and there isn't going no, to be a stealth... No, not on the disabled. Stealth taxes generally. OK. The, the, well, uh, it's, it's hardly surprising that... And, and forgive me, but I've been in business myself, and, and um, one doesn't like to advertise where one's increasing the, uh, the, the, the cost on clients. Uh, even if one feels one has to be honest and, and, and put it somewhere in the paperwork. Um, the reality is that governments of any hue don't particularly like advertising the, uh, the, the increase in costs, particularly when they're trying to attract investment. Now, those costs are falling, just in case you're under any illusion, on uh, the richest 1% and on the largest companies. I mean, as, as Terry set out today, small companies, small and medium companies, are effectively getting various forms of tax relief. And the lower rate taxpayers are also getting tax relief. I mean, now the richest, I think I'm right in saying the richest 1% pay about a third of all income tax, and the richest 10% pay about half of all income tax in this country. So, you know, 
taxes are, fa are actually falling very heavily on the, on the shoulders of those most able to pay. Um, and, it is, and it is being hit in various, being done in various ways. The problem with raw income tax as a, as, a, as a method of doing it is that people find ways around it very, well, relatively easily. Um, and they also don't tend to vote for it because the impression is given uh, that those uh, in what has now become rather bizarrely known as the squeezed middle, I'm not quite sure what that is, except my wife would like me to have, <laughs> but the, um, is, um, is where the taxes are falling, which isn't so. Terry, go on. Um, in 12 weeks, roughly, I'm not sure how many days exactly yeah. you have to vote as a country, yeah. staying in or out of the EU, uh, whichever side you might think you're on now, I think it would be very useful if there was some sort of independent set of facts or information or upside mm -hmm. downs produced by somebody. I haven't yet heard that there's the, the government or some independent organisation is going to produce this that they go out to the left. Is that on the agenda? Well, the problem is nobody agrees. Um, so what you're asking for is something that, that nobody can give you. Because the reality is, any facts I give you, somebody else is going to disagree with. So Roger asked about how many EU rules are going to come in, uh, are we going to be free from? Now, if you listen to some people, 71% of our laws, I can't remember what the latest statistic is now, but you know, whatever it is, some 70 odd percent of our laws come from the EU. If you listen to other people, it's 7%. Now the truth is, of course, both sides are right, in the sense that one side is talking about all EU legislation that comes through. And I say, well, that's true, it is EU legislation, but actually it's WTO and it's filtered through. And the other side is, is saying, well, it's 7% because that's the only EU originated, which is also true, but some of the origination is equal pay. Are we really saying that if we leave the EU, we're not going to do equal pay anymore? Is that, I mean, is, is that what we're actually arguing? Are we going to actually argue that men are paid more than women again, or women are paid more than men? And, and if we're not going to make that argument, then whether the law is an EU law or a UK law or a WTO law, it, it, it's kind of irrelevant. And that's why the facts are really difficult on this. Another one is, you know, how much money do we, do we pay the EU a day? And in raw, absolutely raw numbers, we pay something like £51 million a day. But of course we don't because we've got the tax rebate, you know, we've got Maggie's rebate. So we pay about 30. And then we have a whole series of different benefits that accrue to the United Kingdom. And then we have a whole series of different benefits that accrue to the whole. Are we honestly saying that the UK would make no contribution at all to the migrant crisis in Greece? Really? We'd make no contribution at all. Are we honestly saying that we would make no contribution at all to building the Airbus project in Toulouse, many of the jobs that come to Bristol? Are we really saying that we'd make no contribution at all to air traffic control over European skies? Really? We'd just have our own system? Really? We would, we'd have our own national system with all the costs that that incurs rather than sharing one with... No, of course we're not. All these things are absurd. So the reality is doesn't matter what figure people give you, whether it's you know, 1 million or 50 million a day. These figures are largely meaningless because what they don't tell you is what you get for it. I mean, it's rather like the business here, Peter. You know, you sell office space, right? right. So are you really saying that people would get this, or take this office space if it didn't have water, electricity and Wi-Fi? Well, they wouldn't. Are you really saying you're just paying for the Wi-Fi? Of course you're not just paying for the Wi-Fi, you're also paying for... You, you know what I mean? So it's until you work out what you're actually paying for, none of these figures mean anything. And a lot of people have been throwing these figures around as though they are facts. And of course, they're not facts, because it depends what you think is worth paying for. So if you don't think it's worth paying for, you know, securing our borders with the, uh, the task force that's over in, in, in Greece at the moment, then that's wasted money. And that's money we shouldn't be sending to the EU. But if you think it is worth paying for that, then that's not wasted money. Now, I mean, you may say, well, I'd rather have control of it and I'd rather it wasn't somebody else deciding how 
to do it for us. Fine, I mean, that's a perfectly rational response to it, and there are people who make that argument. But the cost of the EU is less than the cost of Leeds City Council. So it's not, I mean, it's, it's lower than Kent County Council. So it's a significantly lower cost in terms of management of your bureaucracy than many other organisations. Now, you may still feel it's too much. You may still feel that you would rather have your own separate air traffic controls and the organisation to deconflict it. I mean, you know, these are perfectly rational things to say. But do be prepared to have more cost in that case, not less. Rather than detract from my point, all those points are very valid, and they could be some sort of doctrine that puts both sides well, of the argument the without having to be the government, to the wall that these the government has put out. The government has put out various facts. Yeah, the government has put out various facts, and the in campaign has put out various facts, and the out campaign has put out various facts, and you can you can read them, and you can you can evaluate which ones you think matter. Um, but I can't, these aren't independent facts. I'm giving you my opinion as I give you those facts. Because there is no, you know, there is no, I mean, look, I'm reminded of the, do you remember when the Bank of England was asked a number of years ago whether or not we should join the Euro? Do you remember what they came out with, what their answer was? They said, we will be able to tell you whether or not it was a good idea economically to join the bank, to join the Euro in about 400 years time. <laughs> well, because of course it's not an economic question, it's a political one. You know, which is why I'm not shaping this as an economic question when I answer the EU debate. It's, it, you know, frankly, it's, it will have a huge impact on your economy, on our economy. It will have a huge impact on our jobs, both good and bad. But the reality is it's mainly an economic one. It's how do we, how do we see ourselves as a nation? How do we see ourselves playing a part in the world? How do we see ourselves interacting with our neighbours? Do we see ourselves having some role, some influence over how our neighbours behave? Do we think it matters that they survive economically? Do we not think it matters? Maybe we don't. And if it does matter or doesn't matter, how do we impact on that? And I think that's the fundamental of the European Union question. It's, it's what role do you see for Britain? And you know, yeah, of course we should be a trading nation with the whole world. Yeah, of course we should which is why we're negotiating free trade deals with Australia, one that's coming in 2017, another one that's coming in with India soon. Withdrawing from the EU, just by the way, would end those trade deals because those trade deals are negotiated through the EU. So we would have to start again. And just in case you're wondering how many negotiators it takes to do a trade deal with something like TTIP, the American one or, or, or the Australian one, it takes about 40 or 50 trade negotiators, about five to 10 years. How many trade negotiators are there in the United Kingdom today? Anybody got any answers? I can tell you because I asked the question the other day. Two. We have two. Why? Because for 40 years we haven't needed any. How long does it take to train, the Foreign Office estimates, to train a trade negotiator? They estimate it takes two to four years. Because you've got to be legally trained and then you've got to be diplomatically trained. So it's a, sort of, it's a relatively complex. They reckon it takes two to four years. So in about two to four years, we could have 40 who could then start our trade negotiations with others. Now in the meantime, we'd be on WTO terms, which not that bad. They're on an average of 3% tariffs on goods and services. Not quite, actually, sorry, that, that wasn't true either. It's an average of 3%. Cars, it's about 25%. Services, no tariffs at all, don't worry. Why? Can't do it. No cross-border services on WTO terms. <laughs> so, you know, you start to say, oh, well, don't worry, we'll go back to WTO terms, which is what some people are saying. Sure, yeah, no, no, that, that works fine for food not really a food exporting country. I mean, admittedly, our own food supply would probably be a bit cheaper, but not much. So, you know, these, these terms are rather vague. And when you start looking for facts, they become quite difficult. Yes, sir? Based on that information, if I'm providing mm. IT, external IT stuff, 
and I do seventy percent of my business in Europe. Yeah. So Netherlands, Belgium. Yeah. How would that affect me if I'm providing external consultancy to these areas? I don't know. If if we left the European Union, I don't know. Mm. We'd roll on for two years. I mean the. the the deal as it currently stands says if you vote to leave, then you roll on for two years on the same terms during which you negotiate. Maybe we'd get a good deal in those two years. Maybe we wouldn't. Now, I mean, people also say, well, Europe does more trade with us than we do with them. They'd still want to sell us their BMWs and we'd still want to buy their wine. So why wouldn't they do us a good deal? Well, that's true up to a point. Because, of course, there's 27 other countries in the European Union and Germany would want to do a deal with us. I can see why Germany would want to do a deal with us. And France would want to do a deal with us. I can, again, I can see that completely. But given that we're competing on many areas like shipbuilding, I know it doesn't sound like a big thing, but for Greece it is. We're competing on shipbuilding with Greece. We're competing on IT a lot, actually, with uh, many southern European countries, including Spain, funnily enough. Uh, and with the Netherlands and with the Danes. They're not that keen on the deal. Not that keen on the deal. And all you need, don't forget, in the European Union trade negotiations is one country to say no and the deal's off. Now, Germany may wish to sell us their BMWs, but if they can't get the Greeks, the Spaniards and the Dutch to sign, Too bad. Now, at that point, as I said, we go back to WTO terms. Maybe we go back to a free trade agreement. Maybe, maybe we negotiate a free trade agreement. But if we do negotiate a free trade agreement, no free trade agreement includes services. And it doesn't, not because they're being bitter or poisonous or difficult about it. It's not, it's not for any of those reasons. It's that services require common legal standards. They just do. I mean, how the hell can you have a mortgage agreement cross-border if you do not have some common standard as to what property ownership means? I mean, if you don't have that, how can you lend money across a border? You can't. Which is why, just by the way, TTIP, the US trade deal, doesn't include services. Which is why the Canadian deal that we've just signed after 10 years doesn't include services. None of them do include services because services are really difficult to do. They sound like they're easy. But actually, they're the hardest thing. The easiest thing is to buy a car, sell a car. Do the headlights dip or not dip? Are the indicators bright enough or not bright enough? Those are easy. What's really difficult is the common legal standards that allow you to sell services. That's really hard. Which is why the only free trade agreement that does it properly, or does it seriously, is the European Union. Because it allows some sort of common legal understanding. So you can... You know, I don't know is the honest answer, because my bet is your trade would continue for a while and then complexity would kick in and then it would become too much effort. That's my guess. But I, mean, I, I don't know. Maybe complexity wouldn't kick in. Maybe we'd sign a great deal. But it's a bet. Good luck. So Can I make a very quick appeal? My job is to represent you and to represent your interests in Westminster. I can't do that unless you tell me what they are. So can I appeal very strongly to all of you to keep in touch? If there are things that you see coming that are going to affect your business, the way you conduct your affairs, whether through tax, obviously, but also through various bits of legislation, things that are coming up in the European Union, things that are coming up in working time, directive, things that anywhere, that you think are going to affect the way your business can operate, please let me know. Because I can't represent your views, I can't represent your interests if I don't know about it. And maybe I'll know about it already, but don't rely on that. Because the range of experience and the range of knowledge in this room is much greater than I could possibly have for any amount of reading. So I'd be really, really grateful if you would stay in touch with me and let me know when I can help and how I can help. Because I look forward to serving you. Thank you.